All right, we're in uh, Genesis uh, chapter uh, one, Genesis, the foundation book of the Bible. Um, this is uh, lesson number 11, and we're going to talk about the uh, details of the day of rest, and also some more information about man's uh, creation. Now, uh, in chapter one of Genesis, uh, we have seen uh, the three basic acts of creation. I want to just go over those with you so that we're familiar with the sequence. Number one, the creation of the inanimate world. Number two, the creation of the animate world. Number three, the creation of man who is a combination of the inanimate, the animate, and also the spiritual all in one being. We said that a man has a triune nature in that sense, uh, a reflection of God's uh, triune nature. So in Genesis chapter one, we see the panorama of creation unfolding in six days. The world and all that is within it is created and then set into place. Now there's going to be a mention of the seventh day and then Moses will kind of telescope into this panorama in order to give us uh, more detail about the creation of man and also a little more detail about the uh, pre-sin environment, what, what the world was like before sin. Remember last time I told you that um, uh, there are two worlds that we're not familiar with. One is the world to come and one is the world before sin. And those are two, um, two types of worlds, if you wish, that we're not familiar with uh, in the world that we live in uh, today. Okay, uh, after this uh, detail, Moses will begin to tell the story of the first man and woman uh, after the creation is complete. Okay, so I want you to note something very interesting here. Note that the Bible says that everything that was created was created then. Okay, so notice this. Let's go to uh, chapter two actually. We're in chapter two of uh, Genesis, beginning in verse one. Uh, he says the following, thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all of their hosts. And so Moses here is saying everything that was in the heavens and everything that was on the earth was done, was complete. No new creation, no unknown creation. You know, we're always looking for what's unknown. Well, unknown to us, okay, because we haven't seen it, we haven't recognized it yet, uh, but no unknown creation is to come. Everything that God has created is complete. Verse two, he says, by the seventh day God completed His work, which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all of His work, which He hath, uh, which he hath done. Now the word rested here means to refrain from doing. Not necessarily, whew, I'm tired, I gotta, you know, I gotta lie down. You know, we, we kind of look at that word and we see it from that perspective. But the Hebrew word here translated into the English means to, ab, you know, to abstain from work, not to do anything. So God refrained from creating any other form of life, whether it be animate or inanimate or a combination thereof. It even says that by the seventh day, God had completed all that He had proposed to do in creation. Everything that He willed to do was completed. So if it isn't here by this time, then it's not going to be here. We can be looking at all the stars to find something different. <laughs> you know, all the creation is now complete. Uh, this is why I believe there is no life out there in the universe, no human life out there in the universe, simply because uh, the human life that God has created, He's created right here. He's given us a description of that. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's look at verse number three, shall we? Then it says, Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work which God had created and made. And so here we have you know, a repeat of the same idea, except God blesses time itself. He's looked at everything, you know, all the actual things that he's created, but now he actually blesses the idea of time, the movement of time, he even blesses, he even blesses that. He has looked at the things that he has created and blessed, you know, and when, when we say God blesses something, we mean he's making it acceptable. His blessing means this is acceptable, this is good and acceptable. 
Uh, so he's blessed the creation that has been made and also the concept of activity as well. We call it work, right? Now, God uh, uh, blesses the concept of time spent not working. So He blesses what He has made. He blesses activity, man's activity to come, you know, to fill the earth and multiply and so, you know, work, activity. He blesses that type of activity. And then he, he blesses the time that individuals spent not working, resting, recreation. He blesses that. Time not invested in work, time not invested in activity might become an issue of guilt, but God blesses the concept of rest and retreat. So this time of rest will be elaborated and explained through the law as the proper use of time balanced you know, between the actual time of rest and worship and so on and so forth. But for now there's, there's two types of you know, use of time. The use of time to uh, uh, to work, to, you know, for, to, 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 to multiply, to, uh, you know, to manage the earth, the creation, the time that you're doing that, and the time you spend resting, the time you spend not doing those activities, God blesses both of those times. So uh, for now, the pattern of creation is followed. I want you to see, you know, we, we've always talked about there's a, there's a way that God is doing something, there's a pattern in the way that He creates, and it's, 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 it follows right here as well. For example, God creates the generic or the essential concept, whatever it is. In this case, it's the sacredness of time without activity. He blesses that, you know, that, that essence. And then later, He's going to give form to this time as time for rest, time for celebration, time for worship, time for meditation. So He blesses the essence of the thing, you know, time not spent working, and then he'll kind of give it some sort of uh, formality, some sort of form. Well, that time where, when we're not working, uh, he'll, he'll you know, show that that time's to be spent resting, worshiping, uh, communing with God, and so on and so forth. So if you don't think this is important, you know, if you're wondering, why, why are we spending time on this? You know, I mean, there are books out there. People write books like, whenever I stop working, I feel guilty. How many people, if they're not busy doing something, feel guilty, feel, feel ill at ease? You know, they, they always feel they ought to be busy. They ought to be you know, pushing or doing and so on and so forth. And then when, if they just sit down and put their feet up and do nothing, they start, they start feeling bad, start feeling guilty. And so the fact that God blesses even the time that we spend doing nothing, just recreation, rest, doing stuff we like that's not related to work, it's a wonderful thing that He's blessed that time as well because if He blesses it and He accepts it, then we can use it with a clear conscience, we can truly enjoy it and rejoice in it. All right, so God knew that the use of time would be an issue for man and so He blesses a period of time in the cycle which will later be used for rest and for uh, worship. Now, another point to note is that God rested after the work of creation was done, but it did not mean that all His work was done. There's still some to do. He's going to soon begin the work of salvation through Christ, and this too will finish, of course, with Christ on the cross. So the work of creation is done, but it doesn't mean that God's work, you know, the, what he, His activity uh, in the affairs of men, uh, it doesn't mean that that is finished. We don't believe that. We're, we're theists. We don't, we're not deists. Deists, they believe that you know, God just started everything and just let it roll. Doesn't get involved anymore. Theists believe that God not only created the world, had a hand in creating the universe, creating what is, all right, but He also uh, intercedes, if you wish, or, or injects Himself into human history uh, with, the, uh, with the plan of salvation, uh, the Jewish people, and so on and so forth, uh, culminating in the arrival of Christ and His death and resurrection. All right, okay. Now, remember I told you that the natural divisions of the book of Genesis could be 
that of generations. Remember I told you there are different ways of chopping up the book, you know, maybe uh, part A, part B, uh, Genesis 1 to 11, chapters 1 to 11, and then chapters 12 to 50, that's one way to separate the book. Another way is to just separate it into chapters, you know, 50. And then I told you there's a more natural way, more organic way to divide it, and that is by generations. Remember we had a, a whole thing about that. Could be, could be divided by generation because at various points throughout the book of Genesis, the different sections end with the notation, these are the generations of. Well, uh, I just want to go over very, very uh, uh, quickly uh, the um, generational division because we're going to come up to one of these uh, in our reading right here. So uh, there's the generational division. So, uh, first section would be the generations of heaven and earth, chapter 1 to, uh, one, one, uh, to chapter 2 verse 4, which we're going to read here in a minute. The next section, natural division, would be the book of generations of Adam, from chapter 2 verse 4 to chapter 5. Then the next division would be uh, the generations of Noah. The next uh, section would be the generations of the sons of Noah, chapter 6 and forward. Uh, then it would be the generations of Shem, chapters 10 uh, all the way to chapter 11. Next would be the generations of Terah, chapter 11, uh, short here, just uh, several verses. Uh, number seven would be the generations of Isaac, chapter 11 to chapter uh, 25, a long section here. The next would be the generations of Jacob, chapter 25 all the way to chapter 37, and then finally, uh, number nine, the generations of the sons of Jacob, chapter 37, all the way to the beginning of uh, Exodus. Okay? So um, th this section, these sections, the way they're divided, suggests that the ancient patriarchs kept records of their times and passed them down from generation to generation. You know, we read in uh, Genesis chapter two, verse four, we're going to read that in a minute, that we see the, you know, the different sections here naturally divided by the people uh, that are uh, written about in the book of uh, Genesis. And so when God gave Moses instructions to write the book of Genesis, we said that what he probably did was edit these ancient records under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now we know he wrote the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and so on and so forth, because he was there. He was writing about his own experience and the things that took place in the desert and so on and so forth. Obviously, the book of Genesis, he was not there. And so it's always been a challenge to scholars to try to think, well, how did he, how did he do this? How did he write this? Did God just inspire him? Did he have some material to work with? And what we're saying is, yes, he had records from these uh, ancient patriarchs uh, that he was able to edit and use in order to form the book of uh, Genesis. So as we arrive at chapter uh, two, we see that the first section is closed. That's why I've given you all of this. We read chapter two, verse four. It says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. So that passage is simply a passage saying to the reader, this section here talks about the creation of uh, the heavens and the earth. Now this may have been given to Moses directly by God since there were no witnesses to creation. You know, the first section gives the information concerning the generations of the creation itself. It's not talking necessarily about people, it's talking about how God uh, created, the, uh, created the world. Now, the next section, chapter two, verse four, all the way to chapter five, verse one, that's another section that is naturally divided by this saying. And I want you to go to chapter five, verse one, just, uh, just to kind of prove my point here. It says in chapter five, verse one, this is the book of the generations of Adam. Okay, so remember in chapter two, verse four, it says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. So chapter two, one, uh, verse four ends the section on creation. Chapter five, verse one, ends the section on Adam and Eve, if you, if you wish. So note that this section will describe the generation of Adam 
and his life and his times. And then you know, the natural division of Genesis moves on from there according to uh, you know, the list that I just read for you. Now it's been suggested that Adam is the author. In other words, God created Adam with the ability to speak, to write, he was literate. Uh, so the first section there, all the way, or, or the second section rather, chapter two to chapter five, uh, many uh, scholars uh, believe that Adam wrote this. This is his account of the world that he lived in and the events that took place in the garden. This account Moses used to complete uh, his transcript. Now the material in chapter two does not contradict chapter one. Very important. It's going to kind of, it almost seems like it's repeating itself. It's, it's giving you know, more information uh, uh, about the uh, creation. And so um, um, uh, the material in chapter two, um, even though it repeats material from chapter one, uh, does not contradict chapter one. It merely adds more detailed information to what we have in chapter one. So let's go to chapter two and let's uh, read verse five and six, shall we? It says, uh, uh, chapter two, right. Let's go to chapter two. Let me get that right here, read for you. Chapter two, beginning in verse five. It says, now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprouted for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth and there was no man to cultivate the ground, but a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. So here we get a kind of a pre-sin environment. We get a glimpse into what the world was like before the fall of man, before the flood, and so on and so forth. Uh, it demonstrates how things looked, how things operated in the original system where the water canopy above the atmosphere regulated the temperature and the weather. This here, this very brief few lines, uh, is a description of the earth before there was vegetation or animals. How the earth received moisture, not from rainfall, but from mist. And so the earth is moisturized by mist from local evaporation controlled by the water canopy, and also by underground uh, rivers. So the author gives a glimpse into this ancient world, and then he proceeds to explain in detail the creation of man and woman. Now he doesn't elaborate on the preceding days when, uh, you know, vegeta you know, when vegetation appears and animals and so on and so forth. He simply kind of reveals an image of that time period perhaps to establish authenticity, and then he goes directly to describe in more detail the creation of man. Now I want you to understand the transition between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, okay? Genesis 1 is a panoramic view. Imagine you're watching a movie, okay? And, 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 and it's in the opening scene, shall we say. How many movies begin like this? You see a panoramic view, you know, mountains and sky and terrain and, and, and right, you know, right at, the, you know, at the horizon, if you wish, you see just two little dots. Now, you, know, you can't make them out, you just see two little moving dots, but you see all this majestic panoramic view. And you know, usually during that, you, you've got the credits rolling and you know, the, the movie and the music and so on and so forth. And then the camera begins to zoom in on those two little dots and you get a telescopic view. They're not just two little dots, they're a man and a woman, and they're on horses, and they're riding very fast across the, across the plain. It's the same image, right? It's, we're seeing the same thing, except we're now looking at it from a different perspective. We've got a close-up view as the storyteller, if you wish, gets into the action and the story of the movie. Well, Genesis is, is the same. You get this panoramic view, you know, the world is created, and the stars, and the, the earth, and the water is separated, and all, all this is happening, okay? And then chapter two, uh, the author kind of zooms in and is now going to go into a much more close-up view of what is taking place and give us some details. So this is what's happening in, in chapter two, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm moved to think, imagine, imagine that when we live and when we will be with Christ in heaven, 
Imagine, we'll be able to you know, speak to Adam, speak to Eve, and speak to all these patriarchs uh, to, uh, to find out what we want to find out. I don't know, I don't know if we'll have time to speak to them or we'll be too filled with awe and praise uh, uh, that we won't want to take our attention away from God even for a moment. Nevertheless, this is what's taking place here. So we're going to see the creation of man, but now in much more detail, all right? Uh, so we go to verse seven, and uh, it says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So he didn't create over again. This is not a redo. It's the same story, the same scene, except now there's a close-up of what's taking place. So some interesting points here uh, about this verse, about the creation of man. First of all, the uses of the language formed. Okay, the use of the language formed. Here, because in chapter one, he describes the creation of man. In chapter two, he explains how man is formed, how God did it. So chapter one tells you he did it. Chapter two tells you how he did it. Um, I also want you to note that man's body is composed of the basic elements of the earth, right? In verse seven, then Lord, the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. Okay? Not just dust, but the smallest particles of which the earth is formed, you know, nitrogen, oxygen, calcium. You know, he, he makes man out of the basic ingredients of the earth. Now modern science has proven that human beings do share a basic elemental structure with the raw materials of the earth although it is not evident to the eye. I mean, flesh you know, doesn't look like a rock. But modern science has proven that the basic elements of our body uh, comes from, you know, the basic, is, is similar to the basic elements of the earth. Moses had no way of knowing this scientifically, but he reveals this fact 3,500 uh, years ago. Also, note that man's body is formed like the original matter was formed, but now it needs to be energized in order to come to life. Remember, in the beginning, you know, God you know, creates the essentials, right? The basics, stuff, and then the Holy Spirit energizes it, brings it into form, forms it, what it's going to be. Well, uh, uh, this is what's happening here, the same sequence, man is is, is, is brought into being and then he's formed into something. He's energized. So God creates the animals you know, by, by, by a pronouncement of his word and they appear with consciousness, right? He speaks them into being. Let there be, you know, the animals, the birds, the fish, you know, let them be and they, and they appear and they're conscious. They have sentient life and so on and so forth. So now give, now for man, God not only gives sentient life to man, which is consciousness, but a spiritual awareness of God as well. So notice that God doesn't speak this into man. He doesn't, he doesn't say, you know, you're created or you're, like, you're going to be like me, but rather He breathes, he breathes it into existence. This is a much more intimate relationship with the Creator. Something of God goes into the making of man. And the point I'm trying to make here is, unlike the animals, the animals, the birds, those creatures are simply spoken into life. And they are as they are. Man's body is formed of the earth and then breathed into life. His, his, he is energized through the breathing in of God. In other words, God gives something of Himself to man, which He does not do for animals, okay? Um, another point, this also, there's also another way of refuting the idea of, of, of uh, evolution. If evolution is so, the question is, at what point in the scale of evolution does man begin to have the ideas of God's existence? Where, you know, where does that happen? And where in the scale of evolution does man have a notion of beauty or mercy or justice or a sense of ought? Where does that, you know, if it's all survival of the fittest, 
If that's the, the evolutionary plan, then there's no room for mercy there. You know, there's no room for mercy there. Where does that idea, you know, what's the origin of that idea? Love your neighbor as yourself, forgive your enemy. Where does that come from? See what I'm saying? Uh, these things don't come from the ground up. What I'm saying is that high idea, uh, ideas and noble ideas do not emanate from lower species. High ideas come from above. They come from above and they come down to us. In other words, a dog doesn't have a bright idea and pass it on to man. It's never happened that animals train men. It's always that men train animals. So man does not receive his spirit from the lower animals. He receives it from above. He receives it from God at his creation. And so according to the creation model, man begins as an intelligent, believing, communicative, spiritual being. That's how he begins. In evolution, uh, you know, man starts from a low base and evolves upwards. Uh, from a creation uh, perspective, man begins at the top and devolves downward because of, because of sin. All right, let's look at one other thing here. Uh, Adam was the first human being. All right, he was the first human being. That's what the Bible says. There were, there were no human beings created before him and there were no human beings or human-like creatures or whatever created after him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, Paul says, the first man, Adam, was a living soul. So there were no people, there were no humans, there were no higher beings in the type of Adam, all right? Uh, uh, before Adam or after Adam. After Adam, it says, the Bible says, God rested from his creation. So according to the Bible, Adam is the only God-like being created by God. Now some people say, well, it doesn't say he didn't do it. You know, he, the Bible doesn't say he didn't do it. Well, that's not the way we study the Bible. In, the, in Bible study, the rule is we go what the Bible actually says, not, not what it doesn't say. So if the Bible says God created Adam and Adam was the only human, meaning the only God-like being that God created, then what the Bible is teaching us is that Adam is the only one that God created, period. He didn't create any others. There's no use speculating that perhaps, well, maybe God didn't tell us and uh, you know, uh, He created other beings in other universes. Okay? So when God tells us, this is what I've done, it eliminates all the other things. I, I use this example you know, to, to bring this point home. When you go to a fast food at McDonald's, right, and you go in, and you say, I'll have, a, I'll have the number one meal, the Big Mac, I'll have the number one meal. The guy behind the counter doesn't say, now, do you mean to say that you, know, you don't want the quarter pounder? Or you, know, you didn't say you, you didn't want McNugget chicken, chicken McNuggets or something, right? He goes with what you've said. If you say, I want a number one, then that means you don't want any, anything else. Okay, number one, that's it, that's it, number one. See, see the reasoning there? Well, the same reasoning, this is the reasoning we, use, we need to use when we're translating the Bible we're, or we're interpreting the Bible. When God says, concerning this matter, this is what this is, then that eliminates all the other things. So concerning the matter of creation and the creation of God-like beings that can communicate and think and worship God and know God and so on and so forth, concerning those beings, Here's what I've done. I created Adam. He was the first one and he's the only one that I've created. Okay? So this rules out you know, human-like forms in outer space. You know, very sorry, you Star Trek fans. Those of you who are listening, all the money we're spending trying to look at are there intelligent beings out there? I think it's okay to explore the universe and explore stars and planets and so on and so forth, you know, it, it's all God's creation. And so you know, it's out there for us to study and to understand and to glorify God with. 
but to purposefully look for something that God says isn't there, to me, is a waste of time and a waste of money. No use looking for intelligent life because there is none out there. That's not a question of man's egotism or anything like that or pride. It's simply, well, if God says it here in His word, then that matter is settled for me. All right, so next time we get together, we're going to look at how God fires up man's moral capabilities. And we're also going to look at some pre-sin geography and of course the creation of woman. It'll be a very interesting lesson. So thank you for your attention and we'll pick it up at lesson number 12 next time.